Hello and welcome to our webinar from the Australian Research Data Commons. Uh, we are built, funded through the NCRES scheme and we're built from ANS, Nectar and RDS. And if you'd like any further information about um, our merger and where we're going in the future, please sign up to our newsletter. So today um, we're going to be talking about how fair is your data, copyright, licensing and the reuse of data. I'm Kate LeMay and I'm from the ARDC and I've got my colleague Greg Lachlan um, with me here from ARDC and we have um, Baden Appleyard with us who will be speaking to us about um, our new guide that is out uh, around copyright licensing and reuse of data. So we're going to be covering um, a little bit of background of uh, things that have been happening in the uh, research sector um, around the code for responsible conduct of research, and fair data principles, and then um, Baden will be uh, getting into the details about our guide about licensing research data. So the Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research, um, this is a document that is co-owned by the NHMRC, ARC and Universities Australia. It uh, has recently been undergone an extensive review. The new code um, is a principles-based code and it's um, a few short pages of principles and um, it has guides accompanying it that go into more detail for some of the principles. Um, one of the guides has been released and there's further guides coming out soon. So the principle um, that is most relevant to what we're talking about today is principle three and uh, it says to share and communicate research methodology, data and findings openly, responsibly and accurately. And there's two responsibilities, one for institutions and one for researchers that are related to this principle about sharing and communicating um, these items um, and uh, those are available in the code um, as linked at the bottom of this slide to be able to, for you to have a look at. Um, these are quite high level statements um, that there's lots of things that you could do underneath um, these umbrella statements um, and in order to help inst research institutions um, apply these uh, more um, specifically, there's, as I said, there's guides that are uh, being released accompanying the code. There's going to be a management of data and information in re research guide that will be talking to this um, principle of sharing and communicating um, research methodology, data, findings, recordings and primary materials um, in an appropriate way and uh, it will be released by NHMRC, ARC and Universities Australia soon. And the ARDC has been um, involved in the drafting um, and editing of that guide. So also um, the research sector has been uh, talking about the fair data principles um, for the last few years and um, you can see there's a link there to the ANS website which has um, quite a lot of information about what the fair data principles are, how you can um, apply them and um, unpacking what each of the findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable principles might mean for a data set. And also there's a, a fair data assessment tool that has been developed by ARDC and um, you can find that there to assess how fair your data set is. So we're focusing today on reusable um, from the fair data principles uh, because if a data set doesn't have a license, then the secondary user doesn't know how to reuse it. So having said that, um, I will now pass over to Baden and he will be um, speaking to our new licensing guide. Thank you very much, Kate. I really appreciate it. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for your time. Uh, before I begin, it would probably be remiss of me as a lawyer not to um, raise a bunch of disclaimers before we start. Um, talking about the guide a little bit further. Um, and also I'd, I would like to uh, certainly um, uh, acknowledge uh, Greg Lachlan here as well uh, as uh, co-author of this guide because uh, his insight and, um, and putting up with uh, some of the things we, we have to discuss sometimes around uh, the technical detail has been um, um, uh, most grateful, I'm most grateful for that. Um, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. Um, 
And so uh, what I have to say here uh, it does not or should not be intended to be or considered to be um, legal advice from me to you. Um, rather, the material around the guide is really is really that. It's really guidance. Um, and it, it invites readers to obtain further advice um, if their needs require. Um, most institutions or government agencies will have their own, own legal services uh, people. Um, but uh, in, and in, in, in that circumstance, they should probably be speaking uh, to those people for further information. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that while copyright is an internationally fairly consistent phenomena, uh, its characteristics around the world do vary. And so the guide and what I'm talking about really today only addresses the law and licensing as it's relevant to Australia. Um, the other thing is that the, the guide is primarily directed toward people and organisations or facilities that are motivated to share their information or data generally. Um, so as particularly so as to encourage broad reuse of that data. Uh, so um, uh, the, the guide is probably not intended um, to address uh, situations where you might be dealing with data that is, you know, uh, has content in it of importance to national security. Um, it would only be a very small percentage of data probably that does that, but in any event, it's just, um, just worth setting the scene for this guide. Um, the guide is, as uh, Kate indicated, um, compatible with the FAIR FAIR principles, and also the guide to legal interoperability of research data, the principles and implementation guidelines, which is published a little while ago by the Research Data Alliance and CoData. I also had a small hand in that particular document. Um, and finally, I'd like to say thank you to all the people that were involved in providing feedback um, to some exposure drafts of this guide and some of the flowcharts within it. Um, that feedback was immensely helpful and I'm very grateful um, for the time that has been taken for that. So moving right along, um, there's a number of diagrams in the guide and, and this is the first one. I suppose when we start talking about licensing uh, of data and copyright, what I think about in terms of licensing is, is actually legal interoperability. What's the, what will happen to this data set if I apply a particular license to it? What can't happen to that data set if I apply a particular license to it? And so I'm, I'm, excuse me, I was, when I was doing some background reading for this, for this guide, uh, I happened across uh, a delightful lady in, uh, in the United States, Nancy Sims, who's both an attorney and a copyright uh, librarian at the University of Minnesota. And uh, I've, I've um, uh, which with much respect, uh, slightly modified a diagram that I saw her present um, because whilst there is legal ownership of, in this case, data, um, the licensing decision is necessarily more complicated than just who has the legal ownership because the decision is often informed by other things. And I thought it was, um, I thought uh, Nancy's uh, diagram was an excellent way of, of articulating uh, that, that issue. Um, so here we have a, a diagram, um, legal ownership being one important characteristic. And, you know, le legal ownership in and of itself can be a curious thing because um, whilst the, if, if there's copyright attaching to, to data, the, um, the default position is that the creator of the data set will own the copyright. But if you have prepared the data under, uh, under a situation you know, where you're employed, then generally speaking, it will be the employer that may own the copyright in it. In the university and research setting, it becomes a little bit 
more diffuse because some employment agreements that universities have with staff provide that, uh, that the employee shall own the material, but then supply a license back to the university to enable them to exploit it or vice versa. Um, or looking at the other side of the diagram, there might be other business issues at stake. You might have certain grant funding requirements in relation to the data, which requires you to license the data under a particular type of license. Um, there might be other contracts in place. Certainly if you're doing some research that's bound for commercialization, um, there'll be probably a range of secrecy provisions and, and a, a range of complexities around the decision as to which license to apply. Indeed, there's also the prospect of relationships and norms in your particular field of endeavor. You, it may be that your lab has a particular uh, policy about how it licenses materials. Uh, it may be that your colleagues or your supervisors have a particular position on how materials will be licensed. And over and above all of that, I guess, and the point of the guide is to explore options as best as we can to maximise the potential for data reuse. And that's why it's hard to see perhaps in the PowerPoint presentation, but I've added um, that fourth or the, the top circle in that diagram there um, to be a little bit bolder because I think that's in some respects, depending on the complexion of the data and the situation you're in, that is probably the one one um, area that a little more focus needs to needs to happen on. And right in the middle of all that is the sweet spot, working out what the license decision in that is that may may take into account all those those different things. Uh, so the one of the, one of the issues that was raised with me uh, by Greg uh, in the brief in relation to the guide was you know nailing down what is the what what is it about copyright and data is does copyright subsist in data or or doesn't it and to answer that question graphically we've created this fairly high budget um, um, uh, uh, graphic I suppose. Uh, that I have just come to call the grey area graphic. Um, on the left hand side, the law as it stands in Australia now, pretty much since 2010, 2011, maybe a little bit later, stipulates that copyright, that no copyright subsists in data that is machine generated. So um, I think we've used an example in the guide where we've talked about a, a data logger in a stream that might be placed there to measure you know, turbidity or pollutants, things of that nature. Um, the data logger may, uh, by telemetry or otherwise, report back or, or start storing data maybe at a certain amount of intervals. Um, that raw data set in and of itself is not going to have copyright subsisting in it. Um, despite the fact that uh, potentially a great deal of expense and um, expertise has gone into uh, placing that data logger in a particular part of the stream to guarantee that the recordings are the most accurate and only a scientist with special knowledge could have, could have done that. That may well be the case, but copyright doesn't protect ideas, it protects the expression, and in this case, the expression is whatever the machine has expressed. And so um, due to the fact that there's a lack of human authorship and arguably creativity, um, there is no copyright subsisting in that data. Now, the full opposite end of the scale, you have, for example, you know, a book um, or something that's created by human authorship demonstrating creativity in whatever the content is or in the selection or arrangement of the content data. Um, data of that type may well have copyright subsisting in it. 
And I think that position is now fairly, fairly consistent around the world. Um, the difficulty we have is, is the grey area um, because whether copyright subsists in data or not is often a case or a question of fact and degree. Um, between those two polar opposites, a number of interventions can happen by humans that may or may not cause material to become copyright protected. Um, for example, if you take that data log uh, data set, that, that raw machine generated data that I talked about a few moments ago, it, uh, if, a, if a scientist comes along and, and thinks, well, the, maybe there's an error in one particular element of the data, or, and they go and they, they put in their own figures based upon what, what they think it should be. Um, because they have some expertise in the area. Or they change the, the way the data appears, its selection or its arrangement. Um, then that once, um, that data set that was once devoid of copyright protection uh, now becomes protected by copyright. So, but over and above all of that, um, if you're looking to share your data, does this really present a problem? And in my submission, it doesn't. It's um, for want of a better description, a storm in a teacup. Um, so the guy talks about the um, some Creative Commons tools. I think most of the people on the um, webinar today will be aware of Creative Commons, but just briefly for those that are not, um, Creative Commons are a suite of licenses and, and copyright related tools that are freely available on the internet. The slide at the moment that's, that appears before you is just a depiction, of, a graphical depiction of each one of the Creative Commons licenses, but um, they are available uh, on the internet as a, a human readable, uh, license, for want of better words, a human readable description. Um, they don't contain the actual license terms, but in a nutshell, it tells you what the license provides. And uh, but if you click a button on that page, you also get a, a, a full legal license that can be very, very long. But for the sake of uh, usability, um, there's also these these icons that have been prepared by Creative Commons. Creative Commons is an organisation headquartered in the United States but with a global affiliate membership um, and they are effectively the stewards of these licences. There have been a number of versions of them over the years. The current version is version 4 and if you type in Creative Commons uh, attribution licence for example you can see uh, what that looks like. If you just, just Google it you'll, you'll find it. So. The guide makes reference to um, three um, Creative Commons tools in particular, and, and they're represented on this slide uh, with, a, with a tick beside them. Briefly, uh, these icons represent the terms of each of the licenses that, that are available to you to use. Um, the top left is the Creative Commons Attribution Licence. It's the most liberal of the licenses. It basically says, you know, you can apply this license once 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 the license is applied to the material, uh, anybody can come along and, and and reuse that material however they like, as long as they attribute the license all as part of that reuse. Um, moving across a ways, um, just opposite that is the buy share alike license, which basically says take this material and use it however you wish. Um, provided that if you make a derivative of what I have produced, um, you must license that derivative under the same license that I've supplied it to you, which is the share alike license. And then there are some ones we don't recommend at all uh, for data, or certainly not in the context of the guide. Uh, one is the attribution non-commercial license, which 
um, non-commercial basically means that you know the reuse must not be intended toward monetary compensation or financial advantage. Um, so that's a mashup of the attribution and non-commercial. The people that reuse that material must comply with both of those terms. Um, and moving a little ways across from that is the buy non-commercial share alike. Um, down next is the non-derivatives license, which basically says take this material, use it how you wish, but don't make a derivative of it. You may cookie cut some content out, but you can't make a derivative of the, in our case, the data. That's no good for data. So a, a quib or a phrase that I often use is ND doesn't mean you know no derivative, it also means uh, not for data. So uh, because in effect, when anybody ever uses data, they're, they're bound to be creating a derivative of some kind. And the final two are not licenses at all. Um, they're referred to as public domain tools. Um, the one on the right is fairly well known to people in the scientific community as the CC0. Um, the CC0 operates on a number of levels. Um, firstly, it operates to render, um, render any copyright in the material to which it's applied nugatory. So but in effect, the person that applies that material to their, that license to their material is abandoning or seeking to abandon their copyright um, over that material. Now, in some countries, um, doing something like that won't necessarily comply with the law of that country. Uh, and indeed, in Australia, there are some, some concerns and not so much some, some concerns, but um, it, it, it may be that the CC0 is not entirely compatible with the Copyright Act, particularly, uh, for example, in relation to moral rights. Uh, moral rights are non-economic rights. You can't sell them um, or buy them in relation to a material, as you can for the copyright. Um, they, go, they go really to the rights of the author. Um, to ensure that the author is properly attributed and that uh, no derogatory um, uh, use is made of, um, of their material. Now those can't be extinguished by the CC0. So the CC0 has built within it a kind of a fallback position such that if you cannot abandon all of your rights, and it starts to kind of operate as a, a kind of like a CC by license where um, you can pretty much do whatever you like with the material, um, but you've still got to respect some of the things that the law in your country requires. So for example, it might be you know, attribution. Um, so we've made reference in, 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 the, um, in the guide about the use of the CC public, uh, CC0 um, tool, uh, but consistent with what we've said also in the um, in the RDA and, and code data document. If it gets to that point, then what's the harm in using a Creative Commons attribution license? Um, sometimes people in the data space talk about the concerns they have with the Creative Commons attribution license. Uh, some of their concerns, for example, are attribution stacking. Um, if you've got a range of data sets and you're required to attribute every single one of them, well, it's very hard to do when you're mashing a ton of data sets together. But it's important to read the fine print of the attribution license because in there, and in fact, in all of the CC licenses with respect to the attribution, requirement. It's where it's reasonable to the medium. Um, so if attribution can't be employed in the data set itself or in the derivative that's made, then maybe a hyperlink or something to another place that gives the attributions would be suitable. Um, things like that can be dealt with um, under, the, under the attribution license. 
Um, another one we often hear is, well, you know, I don't want to be attributed. And that's fine. And you can, you can, um, you can not be attributed uh, with a CC attribution license. Um, attribution can equal null. So uh, I think in the guide, what, we, what we're really getting at is saying, well, you know, look, you could use the CC0 license, but equally you could use the, C, sorry, you could use the CC0 uh, wa uh, waiver, um, but equally you could use the CC by. The last one on the left-hand side is the CC public domain mark. Now that's not a license or a waiver or anything. It's really a, a placard um, to apply to material that you know, you know does not contain any copyright. And it's simply um, something to notify users that can stumble across or find your data that doesn't contain copyright, that it doesn't in fact contain copyright. Um, and so they can, it's, it's in effect in the public domain. Um, when I use the term public domain, and, and this is often confused in discussions about copyright, public domain can be access, as in I can access it because it's in the public domain, but public domain can also mean copyright does not subsist in the material. And in that situation, I mean the latter, copyright does not subsist in the material. So moving right along, so to make the licensing decision a little bit easier, we've tried to um, put together something simple, um, fairly easy to read, um, that may be of assistance. Um, when I first got this brief, Greg asked me, I think, to produce a copyright licensing guide of about one and a half pages. I think it was something like that. Greg, if it's not, chime in and tell me that. <laughs> I don't think I didn't think that was possible. We we tried to keep it pretty small though. I think we go down to about twelve pages, twelve or thirteen pages, and that's a, that's about as brief as we could make it. But probably the key elements that carry a lot of the content are in the flowcharts themselves. Um, I'll just briefly refer to them, but leave them to you to have a look at more at your leisure. Um, the first one is the data rights holders flowchart. Now this is primarily directed to um, people or organisations that create data. Uh, appreciating though that we are also creators when we merge disparate data sets together and come up with something new. Um, and there may be some you know, mathematical processes ar ar around that uh, that cause things to be a little bit different in different columns. But, but uh, people who are data users can become data creators as well. So looking at the flow chart, there's a slight, there is a, a bit of a connection between the data rights holders flow chart and the data users flow chart. Um, this and the other flow charts also presume um, that it is the intention of the creator to share the data with others. So um, you get spat out fairly early if you don't wish to share your data with anybody else. We've necessarily, there's always a bit of a trade-off. Uh, you could look, honestly, you could write a four or 500 page book about this, probably two or three, um, if you really wanted to go to town. But we didn't have that luxury. So there's a bit of a trade-off between making something simple enough that it's usable, but not too simple that it's unusable, or vice versa, too simple that you can get yourself into trouble. So we've tried to find a fairly conservative approach in relation to a workflow to deciding when and how and what to license uh, material. Um, and on the right hand side, you'll see then there's a number of red boxes. So those red boxes indicate concern, reason for concern or caution, or a need to obtain further legal advice. Um, there's, you, wherever you see it, or generally speaking, wherever you see a cautionary box, um, uh, that's something to be, um, be curious about too, because uh, there may be something in that that you may need to address um, before you seek legal advice or, or, or not. 
but as you can see, um, fairly straightforward as a start here. Uh, do you own all the data set? If you do, that's great. Go down to the next one. If you don't, then do you have permissions to reuse or republish the data components that you have? No, well, you've got to go and get further advice. Um, there's breakout points all the way through. Um, when you're complete, you've hit a green box and the flowchart really can't take you much further than that. So in the bottom one, um, we're saying, uh, sorry, in the bottom box of the first uh, flowchart, you eventually find your way down to selecting a suitable Creative Commons license. We are unashamedly, uh, based upon what we say in the guide, preferring the CC BY version four license. Um, but, you know, cognizant of the fact that you must only select the license that is compatible with all other data components in the data set, if any. And that's sort of one of the reasons why we get some concerns about the share alike license, because depending on what type of share alike licenses you are using, um, particularly if you're intermingling, for example, uh, Creative Commons share alike license material with other types of license with share alike features, maybe some of the European share alike features, those are not the same licenses. They render they they have a bit of a difficulty in almost cancelling each other out because you know, when you make a derivative you can only choose one the lot one license um, and it may not be the one that's appropriate. So um, just take a little bit of care with share alike licenses. If in doubt, you know, ask the license or um, the next is the data users flowchart. Um, again, start here. In effect, um, that flowchart is directed towards people who um, are, are not creating, they're, they're using other people's data. Um, its primary intention is to ensure that users comply with their obligations in relation to those licenses. Um, the secondary intention is in fact to manage the risk of your organisation um, and to support good organisational data management practices. So if um, you have researchers who are using uh, data, they're mashing data sets together and they have desires on publishing data later on, um, it's very helpful to make sure that they go through a process like this to know that what they've actually done with the data is is legal um, before they go doing anything else. Um, and this this particular uh, flowchart has a an additional also check uh, box down the bottom right hand side. Um, uh, moving along to the third one, um, this is the data suppliers flowchart. Now, it's directed towards organisations and facilities more than anything else. Um, its primary purpose is to ensure that, uh, to the extent possible, uh, data sourced through the supplier is, is legally interoperable and also to manage the risk, not only for the supplier, um, but also to um, manage the risk of users and reduce transaction costs for users. Um, we don't want to see a situation, for example, where a data supplier may be considered to be authorising the infringement of uh, copyright in a data set because um, something is not supplied with a, an appropriate licence or an incorrect one or there aren't procedures in place for ensuring that data supplied through a facility um, uh, is, is matched with an appropriate licence. So, uh, from my perspective, that's a bit of a rundown on the guide. Um, some take home points. Um, so if you're a data rights holder, if you publish a data set, apply a license. It's just that simple. Don't put your license, don't put your data set out there without a license. And the reason for that is because the law presumes that if a license is not applied to something, then all rights are reserved. So your right to communicate, your right to, to publish, your right to reproduce that data set uh, doesn't exist 
um, or a user's right to do that does not exist unless the copyright holder has um, offered that, offered a license uh, with that data set to enable users to understand that that's what they can do with that data. Um, I, I really don't think uh, probably needs to go any further than that. Um, but if you want your data to be widely reused, then you should apply an open license. And, and I suppose a bugbear of mine that's I've had for a long time is don't go and create your own open license. Um, the last thing the world needs is yet another open license. There are many, many good uh, open licenses that are about. Um, the guide talks about the Creative Commons licenses because, in my humble opinion, I think they're pretty much the standard these days in most parts of the world. They're very, very good licenses. They're very, very well drafted by some very good people. Um, so apply one of those. Um, make sure you only apply, if you need to go outside of CC BY, the ones that we've recommended in this, in this presentation. For data users, comply with the licenses um, that have been applied to the data you're using. Um, and in the case of CC licenses, you accept the terms of that license with your use. That's that's what that's when the contract, as it were, under the licenses is is formed. Your your use of the license indicates your acceptance of the term. So make sure you comply with the terms. And for data suppliers, um, please ensure that your facility is equipped with the right policies and procedures, and the functionality to supply data with an appropriate license. Um, I think that's about all from me. Uh, Greg, you've been remarkably silent. I think I lost you halfway through. I felt like I was <laughs> flying solo there. I think we had a minor technical glitch. Are you back? Yeah. Are yes, you apologies, Baden. We lost our sound in the webinar room, so we couldn't hear you, but luckily everyone else could. Okay. Uh, so we have, as you can tell, we've relocated uh, and we are um, now available to uh, help with any questions that have come through. So we've got couple that are in the question box and if anyone has any other questions please type them into the question box. So the first question that's in here Baden is if there is no copyright in a data logger would that be the same with an image off the Hubble telescope if it wasn't retouched by human analysts? Well this is a look this is a really interesting issue and I think there's a lot of that legal academics around the world who who have and in fact, I've seen it written somewhere where somebody has, has suggested that there be a new right introduced, um, not like a, a database right that they have in, in, in Europe, but something that recognises some form of, of right in things that do not have copyright. If you think about property and the concept of ownership of property, like we have real property, we can you know buy a house, it's something tangible, we can stand on it, live in it, um, uh, we understand that. Um, intellectual property only has a value and only really exists because a law says that it exists and it has value. If something doesn't have, that, that you'd like to have value that isn't otherwise recognised in law as having it, um, existence or value and that makes things very difficult. I think the general position taken by most lawyers um, is, is that um, there will be a copyright in some of those images. Um, if not copyright then this nebulous concept and I see this increasingly in um, journal publishing agreements with authors um, authors are turning away from the strict notion of copyright to talking about ownership. Do you own this data set? Do you own this image that's come from a satellite? Um, but, but also I would hasten to add that um, the raw image that comes from a satellite could very well be and probably usually is treated by a human when it lands in the base station. So it could be that someone over at Airbus 
or whoever is receiving some of these uh, some of these images could be stitching them together or making them um, making them um, something other than the raw format in which they receive from the sensor. Um, I probably can't take it further than that. It's it's a bit of a moving feast. I would I would say there is probably some ownership. There probably isn't any copyright, and then it comes down to whether you know on a on a contractual basis grounding that ownership in contract and that's i think the way the majority of the world has gone um, they, they talk about ownership um, but i think i think it's an answer that has more questions i know certainly i've had a, it's a good discussion with some it and science lawyers in in sydney um, who have been grappling with this problem for their clients for some time uh, they've chosen a pragmatic view to, to walk along the contract path and just simply say, well, we have some ownership in this. We may not have copyright in it, but we have ownership. The other thing too is people can declare ownership over the physical medium upon which the, the, the material sits. So they can enforce um, uh, you know, access to that material via the medium or the network, admitting somebody to a network that allows them access to that material. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Faden. Um, we've got a couple more questions that have come through, so we'll um, just try to quickly get through them. Um, there's a world of difference between an archive to hold data securely and an access repository where the data may be accessed under whatever conditions. So, um, Greg, uh, what um, is the ARDC's view of these two different levels of data survival? and data access and use, this difference between just archiving the data and putting the data somewhere um, um, where it can be accessed in the, in the framework of licensing. I think that goes back, and I'll be very, very brief because there's some really interesting questions piling in here, Baden. I think you've already answered that because if the intention is not to share, then, then the data is just being held in a secure place. If the intention is to share, it needs to be licensed. I hope that answers the question. So one is put in a particular place so it can be shared and the other one is just like a very safe version of a hard drive. Okay, uh, so Faden, you and I have actually had this discussion um, as well uh, previously. How, the question is how do we license anonymized data sets about human research subjects? It says typically there will be a formal process to apply for access before the data can be released and the applicant is not free to share the data further. So in this case, it's one of those mediated access arrangements. Mm. And so that's, a, that's an arrangement, for example, if you, if you tried to follow that through one of the flow charts, it would probably spit you out and say you need to obtain further advice. And um, I, I, I don't mean to sound like that, I'm avoiding the answer. <laughs> Um, I, I don't intend to, but it's it's a complicated area, and it will be naturally it will be mediated. Um, and I think the guide quite properly points you to obtaining advice from um, the various people in your organisation who are who are dealing with this. So in those situations, it's not a case of putting agreement. a license yeah. on it. There there will be some form of restrictive agreement around. Uh, what can be done with the material. It may even cause or call for the destruction of the material after the, the use has been had of it. Um, there's there's a million and one ways that um, that type of arrangement could go. Um, it, it would be great, in, in fact, if we could come up with a, a, a suite of, you know, kind of a, a suite of, of restrictive um, licenses for certain things. Maybe that's something to think about for the future. Thanks. But not something I can do with today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can't solve all the world's problems in one day. Um, no, in fact, we create, we create some of them as well. <laughs> yeah. So here's another um, problem. Uh, is the copyright holder the appropriate person to add the licence to their data, or could a data supplier do that on their behalf? Uh, well, uh, only if the data supplier has an agreement from the copyright holder to do so, yep. in my view. Um, so it, it should be. It should be the rights holder um, of the data set um, to, to do that. And if, if I was a data supplier facility, um, I would be making damn sure that what my policies say is that before anybody places my data, 
uh, places their data on my facility, they have to put a license on it. And uh, if they have any desires on on the on the license on the data set being reusable, it ought to be an open one, an open license. Um, so we've got an interesting question here. What are the practical consequences of publishing data without a license? For example, if a public data set with a license is mis mixed with an accessible data set which has no license and the result is posted online and the uh, questionnaire said, could I be jailed or fined? <laughs> no, you won't be jailed and no, you won't be fined. Um, not for that anyway. Um, the, the if something is placed on the internet that might have other material in it that is open or licensed or, or even a public domain, um, well, it depends what what treatment has been had of it, how what the, what the mix is. But um, the the user the user takes it as it as it finds it. Um, it may be misled, but nevertheless, the user will take it as they find it. So if they find it without a license on there, then the astute, informed user will think, oh, well, um, this material is all rights reserved. Oh, I can't really do anything with it. Uh, I, can't, um, I can't reuse it. Um, I can view it. Um, I may be able to employ some of the fair dealing provisions in the Copyright Act um, very carefully uh, to, to utilise it, but if I don't fit in one of those provisions, then I can't. Now, what are the options? Well, the person can always go back to the, the um, licensor and say, or in this case, the publisher, because they haven't applied a license to it, and say, look, can you give me a license to reuse this material? And in fact, that happens quite a bit. You quite often find material licensed under a Creative Commons non-commercial license on the internet, um, quite deliberately to expose the material to others uh, in the hope that someone will come and say to them, I love what you've done, can I reuse this commercially? And they'll negotiate another form of agreement, maybe with a fee. The other thing too is that copyright necessarily is something that needs to be monitored by the copyright holder. Um, if you're Apple computer, for example, you'll have ranks of lawyers and firms that go scouring the internet looking for infringements of Apple's trademarks and copyright material and you've probably got about 30 minutes in your use of that before you get a cease and desist letter. Um, but for those of us who don't have those resources, then um, it may be that your misuse or um, inappropriate use of the material goes unnoticed. Um, if and or when it does become noticed though, you may have some questions to answer. I guess that's one of the other things I've, I've often thought about too with, with licensing of material. You know, if you put material onto the internet and you don't, in, but you don't intend people to reuse it, then don't put it on the internet without a license. Just don't, just don't do it because you may as well not. And if, if you're scared about somebody reusing your material, you know, commercially, um, for example, uh, don't do it. Don't, Put it up on the internet. If you if you haven't got resources to pursue infringers of your copyright, then put it up under an open license, and and see what happens. You'll probably be pleasantly surprised. But um, that's just my two cents worth. Anyway. Excellent. Thanks, Braden. Um, we've probably got time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, and if we don't get to anyone's question, um, we we might be able to put um, a Q&A document on the um, uh, website with all the materials from uh, the webinar, answering any other questions that have come through that we haven't had time to address. Um, so Sharon at QUT has asked, um, the Dryad repository applies a CC0 licence for all works submitted, uh, which she thinks is unusual. They state that CC0 does not exempt those who reuse the data from following community norms for scholarly communication, in particularly the citation of the original data authors. Is that the case? Well, I think we're talking about two different things. Um, there's, there's attribution and there's citation, 
for example, they may be one and the same thing, but they can also be two very different things. Um, my my view on that is well, even if if the CC zero does indeed do that, and I reflect again upon the fallback provision in the license, I have to go back and read the CC zero. It's been a little while since I read the code of that. Um, but if that is the case, but yet you're in an academic environment, I think the norms of your organisation and, and the norms of academia nevertheless require you to um, to cite your material. I mean, mm. when it is it is the basis, I think, of, of, of scholarship and scientific inquiry that you, you point to where your sources are from. I don't think there's any harm in doing that. It certainly, it certainly won't uh, disturb the CC0, that's for sure. Okay. Um, so but I'm not a researcher, so maybe, uh, I don't know, Greg, <laughs> you've been relatively silent. So you've answered a bit of reason, I'm sure. <laughs> Certainly, um, attribution is a norm in yeah. um, the scholarly field, definitely. Okay, thank you so much, Baden. Um, you've passed on a wealth of information to all of our participants in the webinar today. And um, the guide that you and Greg have written is a very valuable resource for our research community. And we thank you and Greg for all the hard work that you've put into it. We know it's been a um, very um, long labour of love and we really appreciate the effort that you've both put into making this um, issue as clear as possible uh, for the research community. And thank you for your time today speaking to us all about this. And um, thank you very much, Baden, and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you very much for your time.